Hi, I'm Sue Roffey. Um, I've been a teacher, parent, educational psychologist and academic and um, a writer. And I'm pretty passionate about what's happening in our schools today. A lot of things that are happening around on the well-being front are a little bit piecemeal. So there's, you know, there's some mindfulness and there's some yoga and there's some other things, all of which are good. But in fact, if we want to um, really improve the well-being of young people, then it has to be a whole school approach. Well-being needs to be at the heart of everything that happens in a school. Um, and that includes um, the relationships, the inclusion, the way behaviour is, um, is, is promoted, social and emotional learning, um, everything, basically. As long ago as 1996, UNESCO put out a paper um, identifying the pillars of learning. And um, they've added one since, but at the time there were four pillars of learning, and that was learning to do and learning to know learning to be and learning to live together. And what's happened in our schools over the last decade or so is that there's been an overwhelming focus on learning to know and learning to do, the knowledge and skills um, that they say people need for the future. But in fact, education needs to incorporate those other two because kids are going to learn it by default anyway and unless we promote the positive then they're going to learn the negative and that's not going to be good for their futures and it's not going to be good for the futures of our society so we need a broad curriculum we need a curriculum that is not just about getting everybody to be um, professionals um, it's about getting people to be pleased and proud at aiming to be um, an artisan or a, you know a, somebody who works maybe in a shop or as a hairdresser or as a, a plumber or an electrician and at the moment those sorts of um, professions are seen as somehow failing and the only thing that is really seen as success is if you get a, a, a good degree and then you go and um, make a lot of money and get a lot of status. And what's the problem with that is that that is not necessarily leading the sort of life that brings authentic well-being. We know plenty of people who have managed to get you know, high grades, have gone off to university and their mental health is still suffering. Things beyond exam results really matter. Exam results open doors and give choices. I'd be daft not to say that they didn't, but if we don't actually address those other things, this is not about promoting a, a flourishing life for individuals, for their future families, or for the future communities. I'm um, a great believer in the importance of social and emotional learning in schools. Now, um, there are two ways of, um, of having social and emotional learning and one is um, what happens throughout the whole school. It's the way people talk to each other, it's what people believe about each other. It's not jumping to conclusions when a young person comes in one morning and you know, loses their rag. It's the way that happens makes a big difference because not only does it make a difference to that young person, it also makes a difference to everybody else who, who witnesses it, who, who's involved in that. But um, social emotional learning is also um, helpful in terms of giving young people the opportunities not to talk about personal issues, but actually to talk about um, personal incidents, but actually talk about the issues in their lives in a safe and supportive way. Um, I've been developing um, a program called Circle Solutions now for quite a quite a long time, and it's been evaluated. Um, in several different um, research projects and evaluated pretty positively and it's not about um, just developing individual skills but it's also about perceptions and understanding and working together so that is now based um, in something called the Aspire principles and they have developed over time um, in response to what people have fed back to me and what I have read in the research we had the SEAL programme in England, which um, 
we don't we no longer have and i think that the problem there was that not that it wasn't a very good program in lots of ways the content was fine but i don't think enough focus was put on how to deliver it the pedagogy and i think some teachers thought that it wasn't a safe place to discuss you know emotional issues so the aspire has actually grown out of a lot of things but it provides people with a pedagogy for social emotional learning and the a stands for agency so it's not about telling kids what to think and what to do but actually giving them opportunities and activities in which they develop an understanding of of what's important um it's um it's very easy for teachers to say it's important to control children and my view about that is that it's very important for teachers to be in charge of proceedings but it's not um, helpful for them to try and control kids. So if a, if a young person, you know, when I was a teacher, if a young person came to me and said, you can't make me yeah. miss sometimes, I'd say, no, I can't, you know, it's up to you. I can tell you what will happen if you do this, and I can tell you what will happen if you do that, but, you know, but I'm not going to control you because it's not my place to. And that actually gives kids responsibility. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about about circles is that circles grow solutionaries, kids with answers to things that matter. So it's about them, and it's about giving them a real, authentic voice. The S stands for safety, and for me that safety is encapsulated in not having any individual competition. So nothing in circles is individual. It all happens in pairs or small groups or the larger group. It's also about using the third person. So nobody will be asked to say, you know, it makes me sad when. You'd say, it would make someone sad if. So although they will be thinking about their own circumstances, they're not asked to talk about them. And I think that that gives people much greater freedom to talk about the issues, you know, actually raising incidents. You can actually get into a real difficult situation that involves blame, embarrassment, discomfort, a whole load of real negative emotions. So it's about um, making that a really safe place for people. And the other safety, um, valve really is that nobody has to say anything if they don't want to and that safety valve has been very valuable with a lot of the work that i've done and people have told me teachers have told me that they've had they've had students who have chosen not to speak for weeks and weeks and weeks and they've been allowed not to and then suddenly they find themselves feeling comfortable and able to say something because they've got something to say and they know they'll be heard so the, uh, the P is for positivity. Now, a lot of my work these days is actually based in, in the evidence from positive psychology. And it's about looking at what authentic well-being means. Um, it's looking at you know, how you d develop those, those things and what the people require to flourish. Not about traditional psychology is very much about um, identifying um, problems and deficits and then um, working with treatment and I think that positive psychology is actually saying you know what works for people and how can we get more of it and I like that solution focused approach so the work that I do is very um, solution uh, focused and strengths focused so you were talking about sort of the importance of, of strengths and the language that we use with young people is absolutely critical. The language we use determines how they develop their self-concept. So if we tell a youngster that they're lazy or they're naughty, that's how they think about themselves and that's what they end up living. So if you tell them, you know, you are becoming somebody who is, you know, really responsible and they suddenly think, oh, maybe I'm a, becoming a responsible person. <laughs> and, you know, kids who get labelled, you know, that's how they identify themselves and it's... You know, it's not necessarily useful for them. And it, it determines how other people perceive them as well. And particularly, again, when you give people psychiatric labels. I mean, some of them, yes, are legitimate, but a lot of them are spurious. They are only a description. And if you say a child is disordered with something, then you put the problem squarely within them rather than what um, other people need to do to actually address those issues. So the P for positivity is strengths, solutions, but also looking at some of the other things in, in positive relationships. So it's about 
kindness. It's about gratitude. It's about thankfulness. It's about some of those really lovely qualities that we hope to develop in children with each other and for themselves. Um, the I is for inclusion. And I've just finished um, being um, on the editorial board of Educational and Child Psychology. And my last pieces of work were two issues of um, uh, the journal Educational Psychology that were dedicated to school belonging because we now know that a sense of belonging is absolutely critical to how kids feel about being in schools and it's not in wearing a uniform or even cheering on the football team it's about whether or not people feel that they belong that they feel valued that they feel welcomed that it matters that they're there that they can participate so in the work that I do, children um, for social emotional learning, we mix people up all the time in games usually, you know, which is fun. They love it. Oh, and that's the other bit about positivity. Kids and adults really like having fun in their lives. We, you know, it's, it's crazy to think that education should not be enjoyable. It, of course it should be enjoyable. So a lot of the games that we play... Um, in, in the circle framework that I do in the circle solutions is just about having children laugh together because laughing together increases um, oxytocin in your bodies which is the feel-good neurotransmitter that enables people to feel more positive towards each other to collaborate better and to actually be more resilient you know laughing together in a safe and supportive way is so valuable and it's underestimated really underestimated but belonging also really matters so we mix kids up and we say all right you know we've got an issue here talk to each other about what makes you both proud you know and then and then they might be a feedback to everybody saying being proud means so they might have that more personal conversation just in a small pair um, and then we feed it back and in um, schools where they've taken Circle Solutions on across the whole school, a number of them have developed um, the Circle Framework for their staff meetings. So they mix staff up, they get them to talk about important issues in pairs, and then they all feed back so everybody gets a voice. And it's changed, people tell me, it's changed the tenor of staff meetings. No longer do you have two or three people holding forth and other people sitting at the back trying to get their reports written, you know, or maybe they're knitting. <laughs> I'm um, probably not knitting anymore, but you know, you know what I mean. It's um, it's a different way of doing things. And I have a colleague in Australia who now runs all of her meetings under the Aspire principles with parents, where, whoever, saying this is how we're going to do things because this is important for everybody. So inclusion matters. The feel that you belong matters. Um, Oh, and the other thing about belonging um, is that when kids um, don't feel that they belong or they're thrown out of school, um, uh, especially those kids who are excluded, um, they then look for other places to belong. And we know that they're actually looking for anyone who'll have them. And a lot of the, that will be gang related and actually not in any way healthy for either them or their communities. And also radicalisation, that's another, another issue about where people are belonging. Um, I'm quite sure that, you know, religious fervour is not the only reason why people, you know, go to Syria or want to join groups that, um, that enact terrorism. It's about, it's about feeling sometimes that, you know, this is a group to whom you want to belong or a group that actually accepts you for who you are. Um, the R is for respect. And respect is about not jumping to judgment. And a lot of our kids are really struggling with a lot of things going on in their lives. And if you jump too much to assuming their intentions are uh, malevolent, then you're missing the point. So it's about listening, asking good questions and listening to the answer. It's also about not putting people on the outside. Um, it's not about using your authority um, to intimidate, but using your authority to empower others. And that, to me, is, is a lot about, you know, treating people as you would want to be treated yourself, you know, sort of, you know, with, with, with decency. And I think it happens in schools where people have meetings. And um, sometimes respect is about, you know, not answering the phone when you've got a parent with you talking about something imp important. So it's taking account of other people's cont contexts. 
And the final one is E. When we first started doing this in Aspire, um, E was for um, equality. Well, it is no longer for equality, it's for equity, because equality is about treating everybody the same and having the same expectations for everyone. And I think that kids are different and they are wonderfully, uniquely different. And sometimes that means needing to be flexible. And if we're not flexible in our approaches, then some of our kids are going to seriously miss out. Are oh, seriously missing out, I think.